Hi, sir. My name is Shane Conley. I'm from uh, Sioux City, Iowa, but I, I have some real ties here. I'm um, alumni of Iowa Lakes. What I'm going to be talking about today is something I'm really passionate about, it, and it's real, uh, really based around my mom's healthcare story. But it's really about changes in the delivery of technical education. So when I think of technical, in, a, in Sioux City, now I teach at Western Iowa Tech Community College. The technical side of that isn't just mechanics, it's nursing, it's dental, it's surgery, it's carpentry, it's welding, it's construction, it's all the different technical fields. And from the education standpoint, um, I really believe we're doing it wrong. I, I believe uh, passionately that we're doing it wrong, and a lot of it like said, stems around the story. I didn't realize all the way back in college how many things in my life were tied to really important steps, and where if you skip these steps, things can go wrong in a hurry. And so, pretty much my entire 20s, 30s, uh, was revolved around just focusing and, and thinking about motorcycle mechanics, and uh, didn't really look at anything else. It's like all I knew were these motorcycles, right? And I get into teaching, and I'm thinking, uh, wow, what a, what a dramatic change, you know, there's going to be so much quality and whatnot, and I found out that it was such a business. It blew my mind. Right, like I couldn't understand the first time an uh, administration person came up to me and said, "Hey, you know, Billy's uh, looks like he's failing your course." And I'm like, "Yeah, you know, getting what he, you know, he's putting in." And like, "Well, are you being kind of hard on him?" <laughs> we were six weeks into school; he had been gone 28 days. Mm. I couldn't even believe the conversation was happening. Right? So, and this is really going to get to you guys. So don't get too bored. I promise I'm going to bring it back around. <laughs> uh, and I was like. I even have to have this conversation. I mean, this is simple math. I mean, you got to be here. And so uh, that, was, that was 2007, and I came up with this idea that I needed to be videotaping what I was doing for the students that were gone. So I was extremely passionate about the fact that if you're going to torque something, you're going to work on something, you're going to do this, you can't miss this day of school. you got to know this. Does that make sense? If you miss this, and the way that we deliver technical education and especially in medical, is this day goes to this day, goes to this day, goes to this day. If you miss these days, you don't know how to you know how to function on day five. And I think we can probably agree with that. I think that you're probably either training people, working next to people, and you're going, you don't know that. Like, don't you have a degree? Where'd you go to school? How this happen? You know, it's 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 crazy. So we're gonna kind of talk about fixes and things we can do with that as well. Um, with, uh, with this crazy idea, uh, the original versions, and I, I didn't put any of the footage in here because you would go crazy with trying to watch it, is that we call, uh, I invented this thing called the, uh, the Shane Cam, and I mounted a camera on my head. Because I didn't want anybody to have to look at my ugly mug, what I wanted them to look at is what my hands were doing. Because this wasn't about Shane Conley, this was about the fact that I wanted, to, I wanted you to see the craftsmanship. I wanted you to see what I was doing, and then I was like, this is awesome, YouTube had come out, and I'm like, we can, this is going to be available 24 hours a day? And then there was this huge battle in education, said, no, 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 you can't do that. Anybody want to have an idea why they told me I couldn't do it? People Take a shot. Could, people could see it for free. What's that? People could see it for free. Yeah, that's right. You hit it. <laughs> it was free. And I went, well, isn't that the point? I, in teaching, I want to give this to the students so they have the space. They say, well, no, we need to pack. This is a great idea. We're going to package it, and we're going to do this. And I'm like, whoa, now you're killing the whole idea here of, you know, that this is now has to be packaged. And I'm like, this is an immediate need. We don't have time to package it. Johnny and Susie are going to miss tomorrow how to actually remove a tire properly or whatever. And... Uh, Let's, let's keep something in, you know, I'm going to talk about motorcycles a lot in this, okay? Now, something I want you to think about in my industry is that when they have two wheels, okay? Anybody ever had a flat tire driving down the road? Has anybody had the unfortunate uh, wheel fall off your car yet? Okay, it's coming more and more. People are having tires put on by unqualified techs. They leave the tire shop and the wheel falls off and rolls down the wheel or the road happens a lot. In the motorcycle industry, if we have a tire issue, that might seem really simple. You know, you know a dirty mechanic over there, what do they know, you know? That, if that tire goes wrong on a two-wheeled vehicle, it's a good chance somebody's gonna die, okay? So it's, I take it serious. So when Susie was missing day three of tire removal, I'm like, I don't have time to package this. This is something that needs immediate, uh, we need immediate fix. I find education's really slow. I spent all these years being so laser focused on motorcycles, I'm not looking at other industries to learn from. I'm like, ugh, what a dummy, you know, there's so many other ways to do something in an effective way. So that kind of birthed 
uh, the idea to me to think that I need to look at other industries to uh, to learn from. So kind of come back here, you know, have this opportunity to talk, bring my checklist speech to a hospital and in a story that's based around a lot of deficiencies in a in a healthcare story. It's like it's, I don't need to teach you how to do checklists. Your industry has it. So I'll jump in this. This is what this is all based on, or my experience to this. This doctor, has anybody read this book by chance? Okay, uh, I'm going to butcher his name, but Atul uh, Gawande. And he was uh, commissioned by the World Health Organization to go around to other countries and figure out why surgeries were so unsuccessful in like third world countries. Like we do an appendix here, blindfolded, right? I mean, we do, there's some simple surgeries that you can go in, you rock star it, people are in and out, you know, they're eating that afternoon and you're like, it's, it's amazing with the technology. But you go to these third world countries and people are dying from what we would call something really simple. So he gets out there and he starts traveling the world and the book tells the story in great detail. And the first one he went to was the aircraft industry and found out what their checklists are like. Why do they do what they do? And I think today, that's what the hope is here, is to recommit and maybe you already are, this is just a conversation, that's all it is, right? It's maybe just to recommit you to the value of checklists. Like, why do we do it? Is anybody in here using a uh, checklist on a daily basis? Most everybody in here does it, whether they know it or not. There's something. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. How many people are doing a mental checklist? Okay. I don't know about you, but uh, just for the record, I'm pretty bad shit crazy. Okay. When I get up, if I don't have my keys and my billfold and everything in the same spot, it's unconventional uh, conversation here, by the way. So you can say whatever you want. I was uh, going to vouch for it, but I thought yeah, I better not. Right, right. Let's have fun with this because, uh, you know, there'll be a little bit of a tough story. But uh, I have to have my keys and stuff in a, in a place. And if I don't, I'll get out the door. And then I'm like, is the garage door shut? Let's drive around the block three times. I mean... I, I hate to admit it, but I had to admit it yeah. to be able to function. Because when I didn't admit it, when I didn't, you know, just a year ago, I finally went and got ADHD tested, and I, I just didn't do it out of shame. You know what I mean? I have all these students doing it, and all my coworkers are like, yeah, we knew that like years ago. I mean, you know, textbook. And when I got help, I was like, wow, my life is so much better. Like, this is amazing. So. I mean, I've had some great people in my life that have uh, taught me a lot about healthcare as an adult that I didn't know. You just don't know what you don't know. So that's kind of a real quick intro to the book and what he does. I wanted to tell the, the story of where recently I got foot insoles. And there's this machine you step on and, it's, and it measures how your foot sits on the machine and you get these new insoles. They're pretty cool, right? And uh, so I get to the office and this machine is, you know, it's a little square machine and it's like this. There's a file cabinet here, and there's a desk here, and I'm standing like this to get on the thing. I'm uncomfortable as can be, right? And I'm just like, oh, man, this can't be right. And I turn to the gal, and no offense to be on age at, at all, but she's young, okay? And I mean, I'm thinking, I don't know, she's a day over 20 or something, and, as, and being an instructor, I'm thinking, you, you just don't, you don't know. You don't know. I have compassion for this. I'm a teacher, and I go to pull the machine out. She freaks out. I thought she was going to tackle me. <laughs> oh, my God, you can't touch that. the sensors and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I'm going to work against the wall. And she, you know, so we, we stand there, and we're arguing. She's like, that is $10,000 machine. You can't touch it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, we need to get someone in here then to move it. She's like, I've been doing these for a week. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up, Paul. It's not her fault. It's not our fault. So I want to make sure that when we think about things today where people do something wrong, that how many people use that phrase, oh, it's common sense? Yeah, you probably got to get rid of that because it's, it's all about whether you've learned something. You don't know what you don't know. And I've had to learn to have a lot of grace for that because I spent the whole majority of my life going, what is wrong with you? You know, were you raised in a barn or blah, 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 or, you know, I mean, I said everything, you know, no common sense. I realized it was a really hurtful thing to someone that just plain didn't know better. So this gal, when she told me she'd been doing it for a week, you know what triggered, and by the way, I'm a rock star at what I do. I'll own that, I'll brag it, I'm gonna, I'm confident with that. When it comes to the motorcycle side or whatnot, I am an absolute rock star. I am extremely diagnostic. And so what I saw in that moment was the fact that how many people had insoles that were gonna make it worse. You know, that was where my brain went, right? And uh, so my, my friend, the chiropractor and buddy comes in, I say, hey, we have a conversation, and he looks at me and he's like, what? <laughs> and I said, go stand on the machine. And he goes and he stands on it and he gets all uncomfortable, you know, and he goes, that can't be there. <laughs> he knows, 
ready nose. And I said, how, how long has it been there? And he goes, about a week. We just moved it. It was to move it out with the idea to pull it back out, but, he, but that, that was an assumption. Do you get where I'm going? So that's another thing when it comes to checklists, we get into trouble is making assumptions that people have the knowledge we have, that they have the understanding. So as trainers, as managers, as coworkers, as moms, uh, whatever that is, we have to not take for granted. People don't know what we don't, what we know, right? We need to be more, a little more willing to have conversations to let people know um, why we do something the way we do. The insoles worked out. Kind of take that forward though. Uh, let's take it to a different industry. Okay, so something you guys probably and maybe someone here deals with is medical billing. So on that day, I paid for my uh, services with a check, and three months later, I get a collections notice. Keep in mind, these are friends of mine that own this, right? The, the PT is my best friend. We've traveled to Canada twice. We ride our motorcycles all over the country. You could say other countries as well. And I get a collections notice. So I'm thinking, and it's for $10, mind you. Okay? So I'm thinking, what is going on? This doesn't make sense. I call the office. I don't want to bother them. I want someone else to do their job. That's not their job. He's a chiropractor. He's a PT. I just want to talk to the office person. That's all. I got no energy about it. Like, hey, it must be a mistake, blah, blah, blah. She goes, come pay your bill. <laughs> but, whoa, what are you saying here? No customer service training for you, right? You know, miss the day, miss that day. And uh, so long story short, uh, I, I say this isn't right. I try and get corrected. They want me to refill out all the paperwork. I've never been a patient before at this. I mean, it's just craziness, right? I'm just going to fast forward without all the details. We're going to talk about where we get into trouble and, and don't, use, uh, don't use our head to think sometimes, okay? And now I'm at the point of buying a house. And I get to the point of buying a house, and now what shows up on my credit report? <laughs> and it's a deal now, Matt. You know, now I'm coming out, get a letter, make this happen, fix this. And it's like where we take stuff for granted that we think, oh, it's not going to matter. It's just, you know, just someone else's, you know, little problem. Do you think that employee's still at that company? Mm -hmm. I didn't get fired. This stuff happened to me. I didn't find out until way later. Okay, so they, they had fizzled out eventually. Anyway, how, how did they probably even last within that company? People didn't do something. People didn't say something. Another thing that we're really responsible for is to make note where if someone is untrainable, someone's unteachable, we know what that's like. If they're un, you know, unable to work together and they are costing other people their lives, financial, any of those areas, I think we don't have a voice enough um, to talk about that. So I'll kind of uh, go through this. You get a fancy little clicker here. Um, I talked about, you know, I just wanted today hopefully put the value of checklist back in. So earlier, I didn't get a lot of hands, and I don't know if it's a shy group or something here or whatnot, but on checklists, I think we're all using them. The mental ones really get us into trouble, some of us, because we're going to forget something. Okay? And what always happens to me when I do a mental checklist is that then I'm like, oh, shoot, I forgot that. I hate, I hate even saying that. Oh, shoot, I forgot. Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> I try to use the checklist to just eliminate that. I don't want to deal with that. Um, the other thing is, this is the one that I think is going to relate to you most. How many people in here get so sick of doing the same checklist because it's so redundant? There's probably some checklists that are like, oh, i got to fill this out again. I want to give you a perfect example where that gets us into trouble, and that's why we're trying to revisit and reunite our, our love for checklists, if you will. I went to the DMV, and it uh, turns out I built this the gentleman working. I built his dad a chopper a few years back. So we're always chatting, yeah, how's your dad, blah, blah, blah. So the whole time he's talking to me, and I, I happen to notice he's doing a checklist. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I, I love checklists. Hey, did you ever read this book? You know, talking to him, and, he, and uh, he isn't reading it though. He's just checking it off, and we get done. And there's always been this annoying thing in Iowa to me, uh, and, and I notice really weird things. I told you I'm very diagnostic. In Iowa, when you ever go get a, a license plate or a title transfer for anything, they have to handwrite your phone number on the top of the piece of paper. I don't know if anybody else has ever noticed that. There's no place on the form for your phone number. So the person taking your registration and title handwrites your number on the top They every single time they do this, right? So as the guy is talking to me because he knows me and he's just whipping off the checklist, and I said, oh, that's a checklist. Tell him for doing a title. He goes, yeah. And I said, well, if you skip any of those steps, is there a problem? Oh, yeah. You know, if you didn't do something, it might, go to, it might not get done. It might not log. It might not register. Your renewal might not come up, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, did you read it? And he goes, I feel like it's not every day. Like, I got this thing blindfolded or whatnot. So I know he didn't write my number down, right? 
and I'm talking to him. And I get done, and I turn back after I have everything. I'm like, hey, my phone number. And he goes, oh! <laughs> and he, now, I know that that wouldn't have hurt my license plate or anything else. But the point was, and he's laughing. He's like, oh, you know what? Good reminder. And he literally grabbed the checklist right in front of me and went, you need to do this once in a while. We need to also not take checklists and just and fill them out because we have to fill them out. The checklist is to save time, money, lives, safety. I mean, that's what they're for. So we really want to think about that, and that's what we're going to re-identify. Let's take our, pan our packet there and have some fun with it. There are a thousand ways that things can go wrong. Is that for anybody? <laughs> Welcome to our life. Yeah, you know what? So. This book, like I said, it's a really easy read. It's really well wrote. Mm -hmm. he, but what I'm fascinated from, I've been really blessed in my life to have a couple doctor friends uh, and then people in nursing. My dad ran a lab in Sioux City for 35 years. His wife is a 35-year burn nurse. Um, so I've really, my life, been really had a lot of opportunity to hear about the medical field. And the crossover to mechanical is just unbelievable similar. In the book, he tells how sometimes they get done with a surgery where they save someone's life, and uh, they'll be going, oh, yeah, God, you know, we lost his heart for this, and then we thought it was done, and that was it, and then all of a sudden it came back, and they're like, yeah, somebody did this, and so it's all this, like, high-energy ways they save things. But what he always says is that realistically, every single time was one step away from somebody dying. Every single time it was like in his world, and he's a surgeon, and it was always down to just this one little thing. And if it didn't go right, and it, at the exact right time, you know, I, I gotta tell you this first off, I cannot do what you do, I couldn't fathom it. I don't like the blood for number one, you know, I pass outside my own blood, it's hard to believe, but it's true. Uh, so, what you guys do, I'm, I'm grateful for. So, thank you for your service and for your professions, and how even the administration you're being here makes this world uh, better and more efficient. So, I'm grateful for that. The story that gets me out of here is he's talking about this, and it reminds me back to a day in college where a friend of mine was working in the shop as a mechanic, and this doctor, local doctor here, this was in a corner gas station in Armstrong. And my buddy uh, said the doctor used to love watch him. He has the doctor leaning over his shoulder, and he says, uh, Man, that's so crazy, and he's putting this motor together. And do you know how many pieces are like in your car engine? Okay, hundreds of little pieces. In a motorcycle, there's a thousand because we have our transmission, our motorcycle, our clutch, all that wrapped up in one case. So there's a thousand little pieces. And so the doctor's turning to my buddy and he says, Oh man, it's just so amazing. I just can't believe you could put all that in there. And he's like, You're a surgeon. Like, <laughs> why are you amazed at this? I mean, look what you do. And he goes, Oh, that's easy. And my, so my buddy turns, he goes, what do you mean? He goes, oh, you know, I, there's so much room in here. He goes, you just move organs around, you just stuff them in there. He goes, and then you sew them up. He's like, it's pretty easy. He goes, realistically, he goes, that is a lot harder. And my buddy's looking, he goes, are you kidding? Like, no way. And he goes, no, no, your pieces that you put inside an engine, they are usually a thousandth of an inch apart, and they have to run, Okay. Oh, let's let's stand up. I got great great exercise for you. Good. Just stand up for me. You're gonna love this. Okay. If anybody doesn't mind, maybe possibly having dirty hands. I got four pistons here, so I need four volunteers. Okay. This is the piston that's in your engine. Now what you're gonna do? I just said that that piston rides against its cylinder. Okay. At a thousandth of an inch. Okay. So to put that in perspective, that's about the thickness of four human hairs. Are you with me? Okay. We're doing math here. That's pretty good, right? So take your arm like this, and you guys have the pistons in there. Okay, so that goes up and down. Okay? Okay? Are you with me? In all your cars, trucks, anything out there, at a stoplight out here, at idle, at the stop sign, that goes up and down 16 times a second. Can we do that for me? Go ahead. <laughs> 16 times a second. Go ahead and sit up. I wanna put this into I wanna put this into your imagination here. 16 times a second. This goes up and down at the stop sign. Okay? My race bike, I'm going to show you here in a, in a second. Just flip it through. 320 times a second. Can you wrap your head around that? I mean, aliens, I'm telling you. Like, God is huge. I don't know. But uh, I, I can't imagine this technology. So back to the surgeon story. He's telling my buddy, he says, that's got to be one thousandth of an inch. And, it's, and then it's got to work. So the, the example we just gave for you guys at a stoplight where it's 16 times a second, and then when you say your expectations about any car should last a minimum of 100,000 miles, like everybody just has that generic number in their head. It has to go and do it for 100,000 miles. 
Okay, it's crazy. It's crazy techno. So my buddy, this is the joke part. He turns to the doctor. He says, "Well, hey, now wait a second here. Then how come you get paid ninety-two thousand times more than I do?" And he looks at him. And he puts his arm around. He says, "Try and work on that while it's running." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty true. Okay, all right. You know, ours get to pause. We get to take the heart out, and we get to, you know, uh, and we get to bring it back to life in a very controlled environment every day. You guys are working on live people, so the. Ways things can go wrong a thousand times is completely different on live people. I've really learned that through my mom's story of just how uh, you really have to analyze that data. And, and when you just go to the textbook checklist, when you just uh, you act like a robot, uh, this this is a new uh, platform for me to do public speaking and whatnot. And it's and my my company is going to be called You're You're Not a Robot. And um, I think as much as I talk about checklists and the implementation of them, there's the other side that if we follow them all the time, would you agree sometimes we can get into trouble? Yeah. So you'll hear some of that in the story. Well, am I keeping your attention? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you kind of wondering, you know, why all the passion behind this? What's this like? My mom's story for 10 years dealing with her health care battles. I didn't understand why I was mad for 10 years. I was a pretty fun guy in my 20s, okay, my early 30s. I, and I just started dealing with the health care stuff, and I started getting really mad. And it wasn't until the day she passed, which was just last October here, that it all of a sudden hit me. Like in this huge relief of, wow, now I understand why I was so angry. When I was teaching motorcycle mechanics or at my doctor's office or at my insurance agent or whatnot, and somebody would do something wrong in those 10 years, my brain subconsciously went, how's my mom ever going to get healed? If we can't do my insurance policy right, if we can't do my banking right, if we can't put a tire on my car, right? How am I ever going to expect my mom's health care to get any better when I kept seeing like things that were just being overlooked? Does that kind of make sense? And so last October 17th, I decided I'm going to go out with a passionate, I'm going to quit trying to fall on ears that don't want to hear it. I'm going to try and find the people that want to make change. And I started doing that on my YouTube channel, and it just exploded. People started saying, we love this. That's what's missing in America. We're missing accountability. Everybody gets a cookie. The whole education system of everybody gets a trophy, Every, um, everybody needs to know how, how great they are. Some people aren't great. And we're giving people credit that isn't, that, that doesn't have any value. And it, you guys, and I don't know what you think here, what now, a lot of people say the community college degree isn't worth anything. You ever heard that? No. Now I, I even hear where people say the bachelor's degree isn't worth anything, that you gotta have a master's, you know? We're, we're forcing this down people's throat to say this is how, this is how things have to be. And when you think how this country is built and how we laid one brick at a time, it was on integrity, it was on accountability, it was on showing up. There's a, a, a gentleman you guys might know from TV uh, called Mike Rowe, uh, uh, Dirtiest Jobs. He is passionate about all the technical um, education out there in the medical field. He's right after that. He's like, we need more funding, we need more government help and to get people a craft or a trade. But one thing that he's big and passionate about is make it valuable. Don't just shove them through school, the D gets a degree, and now they're out in the field, and that's where we end up with stuff that, that happened with my mom. And I'm sure you guys see it all the time. We end up with an excuse-ridden world where we, uh, we have lots of uh, failures that happen with that. My mom's story here, um, that's her, is she pretty? Mm -hmm. uh, she was just a, a great guy. I'm gonna try really hard not to get choked up, it's still pretty fresh, but it's getting fun, it's getting better, and I'm just wanting to do this in the, definitely in her memory. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the negative, and then we'll wrap up because I know you guys are probably wanting to get out of here too, uh, to go save lives, right? That's what you're all doing because you're amazing. Um, so we'll start with the beginning. So can you do me a favor? Can you just hold that piece of paper up in front of you and flip it over? We're going to pretend here for a second. Just after, uh, I guess it's not blank in the back. Just hold the paper up in front of you. Okay, you're 56 years old. So she gets this job, and she's at day 88, and this is where your little acting piece is going to be. She's at day 88. Some of you might already know what that number is probably leaning towards, and uh, of a 90-day probation. And she gets in there, and I take her to lunch on day 87, and the minister, you know, her boss, and I goes, we love your mom. She's awesome. You know, best thing that ever happened here. She's organized all this. Oh, we couldn't live without her. The next day, she's sitting at her desk in the morning, and uh, the lady comes up, and I'm going to use you. Okay. Comes like this and says, hey, Jerry, uh, this came by fax. It, it must have accidentally came here. I didn't read it. Okay. Now you're going to read it. You're going to pretend to read it. Patient number 12456 is terminally diagnosed with leukemia and blah, 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 and all this other stuff. 
it's probably just we choked up. We recommend immediate treatment, life expectancy, blah, 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 all this, all this data. She finds out by facts. Oh, 56 years old. The doctor's office accidentally faxed it to her work. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it gets worse. Four hours later, they fire her. Four hours later, they fired her. So here's this broken, tough mom. Okay, she wouldn't tell any of us how sick she was. Okay, I'm the only surviving son. Um, she's just like, not only is she sick, now she knows why she's sick, and she now gets fired from the one job that was hopefully going to give her the health insurance to go get the good health care. Good health care. I hope you all are providing good health care, right? Like caring people. She had a new doctor she loved. Things were sparking up. I watched her health get better. I always was a, I was a jerk of just thinking it was always depression. Come on, mom, let's you know you can get through this. You know I've gotten through everything. You can get through anything. And uh, so my mom, of course, she wouldn't sue. And we were like, ah, somebody should be responsible for this. And I'll, the person that sent it, I bet you to this day doesn't even know what they did. Yeah. Doesn't even know what they did. Okay. So so my grace was really really limited at that time. So what my mom says, I just want to get healthy. Let's just get me healthy. So uh, the lawyer that I tried to get her to talk to said, just get on Social Security. Just get on disability. Well, here is a 56-year-old woman that raised two children, had never taken food stamps in her life, had never taken a dollar of anything, worked 30 years, and that stubborn woman made it hell for us. Because she's, I'm not doing that. I've never taken food stamps in my life, and I'm not going to start now. So that was the next challenge. Finally, it just got to a point where she had to get assistance, had to get on Medicare, Medicaid, things like that, and, uh, and get help. So we're going to kind of fast forward. She does chemo. And at this point, now I move up here. So now I'm two hours away trying to manage this. Okay? And uh, it's just the craziness of this. And I just didn't really understand how bad cancer was. I'd never been around it. I just didn't understand it, okay? So I start going, and I go to the doctor's office, and I have the month off at Christmas being a teacher, and I get in there, and she'd walk in her own two feet, and at the end of the day, we take her to the intensive care unit. She'd spend a night in intensive care. She'd get out the next day. She'd be stable, and this process just repeated. And so I'm, I'm looking at the med list myself now and going, well, why is there a medicine that raises bl blood pressure, and why is there one that lowers it at the same time? And so the doctor wasn't there. They wouldn't even talk to you. Is this, anybody got a God complex in here, by the way? <laughs> yes, you do. You're medical. You know who has a worse God complex than you? This will blow your mind. Teachers. Teachers. It's unbelievable, the God complex in education. Like, I can't even understand how people don't want to look at change or look at actual data or whatnot. So the, the, the God complex doctor would talk to me, but this PA comes in. And looks at this goes, why? So my mom's on like 20 medication. He goes, why are they having you do this one, this one, same time, and why? Anyway, so he goes and he, he, whatever she was taking, he knocks it down to like 12. Guess what? She quit going to the emergency room. She come and get her chemo, and we we're grateful for this man. We we're grateful for his willingness to look at things. We were grateful for him to be brave enough to have a voice. You know why he had a voice? He was a traveling PA. Mm, yeah, okay, now you got, you know what I'm talking about. You ever notice your traveling nurses, I have a ridiculously loud voice, right? They're opinionated. What well, they got to lose? They can be, they can bring stuff to light, and they don't have to worry about costing their job. If it costs them their job, they're just going to move on to the next place, but they, have a, they probably have a deep desire to call out what's wrong. We're scared. We don't want to hurt your feelings or your feelings or whatnot. We have this whole feeling complex, and that makes it really tough. We forget... I normally have a football that I keep that I throw around. If we think about us all being on the same team and that our goal is to save the patients, oh, God, it'd just be so different. And I think we've lost some of that deal. The moment someone says we did something wrong, we got, we got mommy and daddy damage that is breaking us. Okay, well, oh, no, I didn't do it right or whatnot. Instead of coming alongside each other and going, hey, can we make a change here? Have you ever seen this? Have you ever noticed this? Can I help you through this? And those are just my opinions. So... Uh, I think you might see some of that. So this is funny. Out of Sioux City, I was directed to go to Spencer, Iowa to get wigs. And so I thought I'd play along and make it a fun day. Mom was a lot cuter and I was in, in the wig here and whatnot. So we were trying to, trying to make the best. So I remember that day walking out for the first time. I think I was 36 or something and realized my mom's going to die. Like that day, 
I finally was like, oh my gosh, she's going to die. So she's lost our hair. She can't drive now. She's <laughs> lost her eyesight. Not lost it, but it's gotten real minimal. And so she's really sick. So she finally gets down uh, to uh, a month to live. And they say, go to Mayo. And, you know, of course, everybody's like, oh, can we go to Mayo? Can we go to Mayo? I'm like, no, you got to be sick enough. you got to or, or have a lot of money or the other. And so we finally get to Mayo. I'm going to kind of fast forward some of this. And uh, we get this Doogie Hauser, like, 30-year-old doctor, this young doctor. And, of course, I walk in. I'm like, oh, God. Mayo's amazing, by the way. Like a clock. Like a sewing machine. Your appointment's at 11 o'clock. You're walking at 11 o'clock. I don't know how they do it. You feel like the presence of angels everywhere around there. It's just unbelievable to me, the customer service, the kindness, the, the, and as somebody that's been in a lot of different medical, situ, you know, situations. Um, so this Dewey Hauser young doctor gets in there and he says, I got good news, quick chemo. And we're sitting there. Now, you know, my mom, man, she knows who I am. She's waiting for me to pound the question. So the doctor says to me, you don't have cancer. <laughs> she was misdiagnosed. Right? That's what my comment was. Oh my God. My mom's like, I can't quit the chemo. It's the only thing keeping me alive. She's brained into this now at nine months that she can't quit chemo. She's watching all the other people dying. She has to do the chemo or she will not stay alive. She's what a fighting woman, right? I mean, just hearing a little bit, she was a fighter. She wasn't going to give. As long as I was alive, she was not giving up. Uh, so Doogie, I'm going to call him Doogie, he was from England or something, says, no, let me explain. This is an unfortunate deal. Here at Mayo, we have another tool. And he turns to me and he's looking at me. And he's got this just intensity, right? So he's looking at me and he says like this. He says, you're a mechanic, right? And I say, yeah, how do you know that? How does he know about me? And he says, I looked you up. He says, so I want to explain this to you so you understand. So we have this tool that has the ability to take and do another test of the dots on the spine that look like cancer. It's actually liver disease. And that's why you've lived so long with this. You've probably had liver disease for 15 years. So he goes on and he's explaining all this. And he starts to keep talking like in my language. He's talking like a mechanic. And, and I said, are you a mechanic? He says, oh, no, no. I've just had really good training. I said, no, wait. And, and my mom's like, oh. So we stopped for a second. My mom's looking at me. She's hitting me on the leg. And she goes, okay. I'm like, what? She goes, I start asking. And I go, asking what? She goes, don't you have questions? I go, I got nothing. Like, he answered everything so amazing, it blew my mind, right? And I turned to him, I said, you've got to tell me what you did. He goes, well, in England or wherever he's from, he says, we get training to actually learn how to use medical terms to match other people's industry. So they would actually try to do mock conversations with a carpenter, an accountant, a lawyer, through med Is that mind-boggling? And I'm like, maybe that happens here in America. I don't know, but he sure brought it over from England, and it blew my mind because I totally understood what he was talking about. I understand, but I understand mechanics and tools and whatnot. So we quit the chemo. Uh, five months later, she got her hair back. I bought her this little car. I even drove it today, and uh, um, her eyesight had really come back, and she started to live again. And so we got we got another uh, uh, almost five years together. Sit Mayo. Uh, and we had, great, we had a lot of great health care things. We had a lot of great health care situations, a lot. But just once in a while, some of them really sucked. Some of them really sucked. And uh, uh, the one, the most recent one was when she got really ill, and I'm sure you all know what this is, right? The uh, insulin pin. And so they, they were training me how to change IVs and if an emergency to give her insulin. So that was at the point they were afraid she couldn't do it. She was just so all over the place. Her blood sugars for years were just crazy crazy all over the place. And so as a diagnostic technician, I'm like, let's look at the charts. Let's graph it out. And I drove my mom crazy because I want her to write it down to create patterns and to, you know, so I could see how this worked, right? And so the, the nurse comes in to do the training at the hospital. We're in, uh, in the, uh, she's uh, at the hospital. Uh, she was stuck there for months. And uh, they come in and, and I get out a notepad and I start taking notes and the nurse, the trainer looks at me and she goes, what do you do? I saw a mechanic, I teach mechanics. She turns her mouth and she says, oh, you're in perfect hands. Mechanic, they, they are awesome. Mechanics never have any problems. I'm thinking, not in my world. You know, <laughs> oh my gosh, too many parts fall off. It's crazy. So we, we practice on oranges, okay? And we do this and we're, we're doing it and they, you know, and I'm looking, I've watched my mom do this for years. And so she, the trainer opens it up dials it to like two and purges it. Now being a mechanic, I use syringes without the needles all the time. And what do I do? I purge the air out. That makes sense. I turn to my mom and I'm like, do you know that? 
And she says, no one ever told me. And she's sitting with that big old smiley face. No one ever told me to purge the needle. And I'm looking at the nurse like, she, you been, she goes, well, how long have you been diabetic? She's like, well, about 10 years. 10 years she hadn't been purging the air out. It's not the end of the world. Okay, I get that. I get that. It's a small amount. But the thing was, if the doctor wanted her to dial up 40 units and she's not getting 40 units, the idea of the 40 units is, you guys are pretty amazing. It's calculated to put her blood sugar here, right? So I'm like, Mom, another victory. You are going to be so much healthier getting the right insulin. So we're laughing. It's pretty cool. So the next night, this uh, young male nurse comes in, and uh, he's like, you know, hey, I'm here to give your insulin. I said, can I do it? I want to poke my mom. I've been wanting to do this for years. And he says, no, insurance, blah, blah, blah. I need to do it. So he, uh, he says, you know, okay. So we're, my mom, we're talking, and he gets the needle out, sets it. What's he not do? Doesn't purge it. My mom, this is the cool part, here's the teacher in me, her eyes go. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, she got it. She retained it. She learned it. And I say, hey, fella. And uh, mom goes, you be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go outside. And this is where you're going to kind of come into this, okay? I hope, I think, right? So we, uh, we get out there and we're standing in the hallway and I say, hey, listen, I'm a mechanic. And one thing, I know tools. I love tools. And I know that there's tools work differently. And there might be a different pin. I just got training on this. And the pin I got trained on said I needed to purge it. That's how thorough I am. Okay. And by the way, in the manual, it tells you to purge it. It's one of the checklist steps in the manual, which my mom did not find very funny. I, I thought it was funny. But. So I, I say, is there a different type of tools that preloaded or something? He goes, oh, no, no, you don't have to do that. I said, where'd you go to school? He didn't go right teach, but he said, which doesn't matter. Okay, that's the whole point of all this. And I said, uh, you know what, let's just do this. Can we go get the head floor nurse? I really think you need to purge this, and I, I'd like us to find out. He goes, yeah, no problem. I said, how long have you been a nurse? He says, six months. I said, six months. Well, how many times have you done this? Well, I don't know, geez, hundreds, of thousands. I don't know. I do it every single day, multiple times a day. And I said, okay, well, let's just go find out. So the head nurse comes back in. Now imagine we're all standing. He doesn't warn her, which blew my mind, right? Like say, hey, we got to sit, because he's that confident. And uh, so he, he's sitting there, and I explain the situation. She turns to him. Now, here's imagine. This is a, I don't know what I call administration, but it's a leader. She turns to him. She goes, what are you doing? <laughs> of course you got to purge the needle. And I know what she's thinking right away. She's thinking about the, the scale against the wall thing. What the hell else are you doing wrong? Right? You know what I mean? That's what she's thinking. She's thinking, if you didn't purge the insulin needle, what else don't you know? Why is your confidence level? And so she, I'm like, so this yelling goes back for I'm like, stop. Stop. You are just as at fault as he is. And so am I. And she looks at me confused. I go, let's, let's think about this for a second. I go, you've been a nurse for six months. You went to school for a measly two years and you think you're an expert? You think you're a craftsman? You think that you got medical? You're going to learn the rest of your life. I said, listen, did you ever fight with your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your dog die, your cat get sick? Did you ever miss a day of school in six months? Well, yeah, of course. So you think you missed something? Do you think you missed a step? You missed a training? You missed something? I said, the problem with students is they come out, and this is where my fault is, meaning the education system, we tell them, hey, come to our school of two years, you're going to have this degree, and you're going to be qualified. You're, qualified. you're not qualified to do hardly anything. You know what you're qualified to do? to not learn. The only way they're really going to learn is getting in the field, doing the job, getting dirty, getting bloody, whatever way you want to look at it. you got to get out there and do it. And the student looked at me and he's just like a chuck. I turned to the, no, I turned to the nurse you know, and I said, and you're at fault. She says, how am I at fault? I go, you hire these people as young, if fresh, you age doesn't have anything good. Hire people fresh out of school and you think they know it all and you don't check them. Where's the mentorship? Where's the craftsmanship? Let's get back to the brick by brick of America. Do you think they just stuck people out there? And, and, I know, and, and here's the thing that's hard about this. I really had to think about how am I going to deliver this message to medical? Because when it comes to education, you guys honestly have it way better than any other industry. You have clinicals. There's a lot of mentorship. It blows my mind that he made it that far without knowing to purge the needle, honestly. You know what I mean? So your industry is further ahead, I would say, when it comes to education than anybody else. But there's still loopholes. So when you hire someone, when you mentor someone, when you work alongside someone, we want to be able to have an open conversation to question, hey, why do you do that? Or do you know what you're doing or whatnot? And uh, so we all kind of just put our heads down and say, go back, mom. Let's just get through. We'll get through this. She's going to be fine. 
the kid comes in the next day crying. It blew my mind. He comes in the next day in plain clothes and he says, Oh, I don't know what to do. I didn't sleep all night. And he goes, I, mean, I want to be a doctor. This is, I, I want to go. I said, oh, please do. That knot you have in your gut right now, we need people with uh, the ability to have that knot. That's what we need to question, to care, to concern. I go, go on. He's hugging my mom. My mom's hugging him. And I go, you know, she's been doing it 10 years that way. He goes, why didn't you tell me that yesterday? I said, because I wanted you to not sleep. Why? That's the whole idea. You know, and he goes, you're such a teacher. <laughs> uh, to finish off here, when do we typically feel the need for a checklist? When something happens. When something goes wrong. That's exactly. When something goes wrong, and usually enough times, people start to go, whoa, we should do something about that. These are other industries I want people to think about. Do you want to be driving across the bridge and worried about whether the welder knew how to weld? No. Yeah. Should you have to get out of your car, walk over to the nameplate on the bridge and go, Okay, that's, you know, Barnes and whoever construction and Google them and go, yep, they have their certification and then trust the certification and now decide to drive across the bridge. Do you realize how much stuff we take for granted every day? You know, do people really know what they're doing? A lot of people say, well, you know, I don't have checklists or I don't need them. And uh, what I realized a couple of years ago, I had a checklist in front of me every single day and I didn't know it. And they were the lab sheets that I was using in class. And you guys have instructions, you have work orders, you have, maybe it's a deal where it's, go see this patient in this room and this, I don't know how it goes or whatnot. And as we go to electronic, I think we're having a lot more failures come across from not having tangible paper. Um, that's one of my, my fears of when everything's electronically because we can't always write, you know, to check something off. But uh, any document you have that you're handing an employer you're using and it has sets of instructions, you can check them off. And so what this girl was doing in my class, she was checking off each one, and I would go to grade it, and it drove me crazy. I'm like, hey, quit checking your paper. I go, I, I'm the teacher. I own that number. I said, I need that space to check it check it wrong, right? And she looks at me. She goes, okay. Well, next day she goes, like, Shane, I'm really struggling. I really need to check those. I really have, you know, I have an issue where I need to be able to check those, or I don't know I did it. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's a checklist. It already exists. So what did I do? And uh, if she got one wrong, I would put an X through it. You know, it was such a simple adjustment because I got on my God complex. I listened to the student's need. You should listen to the employee's need. What is it that we could work together and come a solution? What that ultimately ended up being, I even changed the directions. Now, every student from that year forward uses as a checklist. If they turn it in not checked, I don't accept it. Um, so that really plans to be, you know what I saw? I saw, I saw skill sets go up. I saw people, uh, grades go up. I saw a lot of people be able to do things more effectively. Um, I'm going to get to Evelyn here. So has anybody heard of this gal, Evelyn McKnight? And she got infected with hep C. And she was one of uh, 99 people out of 650 people that came into potential contact. So can you imagine for her, she got her letter on a Friday. And when she opened the mail, the office was closed that said, hey, we need to make an appointment for you. You're one of, she was there for cancer treatments. And what was happening is apparently like there was a saline bag on the wall, and they were somehow, <coughs> I just blows my mind, but, and you'd think that this was a one-time thing. They'd take a needle, a syringe, and they were reusing it all day long somehow. And so the bag would start clean, and by the end of the day, it would be pink. You're in medical, like I see your face right now. I see you, and you're like, oh, no, this, this ain't possible, right? It happened. Okay, so she ended up getting it, and instead of taking the lawsuit, uh, instead of taking the money, she fought it and actually kept fighting, went on a battle, I think for like eight years, and uh, would not quit, was relentless, that until that hospital would make a checklist to make this never happen again so someone would never go through it, by the time they finally you know, settled, the, the checklists that are uh, throughout Iowa and Nebraska are because of this gal. She fought this for years, and uh, for people that I've met, they said that they saw those checklists come in and change how things were done to prevent this error from happening. So at the end of her speech, it's an 18-minute speech, she, uh, she says, uh, um, she starts crying. She starts weeping, and she goes, you know, I thought I fixed it. I thought I, this would never happen to another person. I looked up some data here. Just in... Uh, in uh, 2008, 40,000 people in Nevada were infected. This was like 2002 when she settled or something, or when it, it when this started to be noticed. It was in the early 2000s. In 2008, 40,000 people got that letter. The same exact procedure was being done. 40,000. 
in, in 2014, 4,800. In Jan or in, uh, I think it was February of this year, if you Google it, 200 people in New Jersey got a letter that they need to see if they were infected. It, it's mind-boggling, like how the checklist is there. How could this still happen? Isn't that crazy? Um, my, my conclusion on this is that we're not perfect, and we're going to err. And uh, to, to understand whether the error was a lack of knowledge or just a lack of caring, I think we can find grace in a lack of knowledge and mistakes happen and let's do retraining or let's think about this. When we see repeated things done over and over because we don't care or we're making excuses or whatever, I think that's where we end up with stories like my mom. Uh, her, her final day, uh, her final day, you guys know all these blood readers, right? Um, her final day, who's a nurse in here? Quiz. There's only a few of us. <laughs> you? Okay, so that was her blood sugar. 22. 22. And they gave her insulin. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. Finally, finally people who understand. Oh. 22, they gave her insulin. I got there, she was alive. We had a fun day planned. I was finally going to take her flea market shopping. Um, I, I still own the outlet building down here on my corner. I, I, I'm the crazy guy back in 2008 that opened a flea market out of there and had a motorcycle shop in the back. I don't know if anybody ever accidentally went to it. And, um, it was great. You know, people come in shop and you work on your bike and uh, Ken Gallagher rents it from me now. And uh, so I love flea markets. My mom and I said we really enjoy it. And I get there and she doesn't know who I am. And it's heartbreaking. But I was used to it at this point. And so she starts her blood sugar, comes around, and I'm... So I go to get the nurse, I go, hey, you know, what's going on, Jerry? They take off running. <sighs> Run down the hallway. I'm like, whoa, what's going on? I just want to know if something happened. They're like, they're Jerry, Jerry, you okay? And she's kind of back to it at this point. I could tell, I could tell you, I bet she was up to uh, 80 or 90th point because I was used to it at that at that time, right? And it, they said, oh, she was really bad this morning. And they said she was 22. I said, why is she not in the hospital? They've always taken her to the hospital at 50. If she was 400, they take her to the hospital or she was 50. That day, they chose not to. And when I went to the nurse, uh, and she showed me this, I said, and I saw the pin. I don't know why, but it was out. And I said, well, why, why would you give her insulin? She goes, I have to. And I'm like, whoa, what do you mean you have to? This was at a nursing home, assisted living. And I go, and my mom's still alive. And I said, you just put a gun to her head. I brought her here because I can't take care of her. You're going to kill her. Two hours later, she died. I know for that person, she's struggling hard. And her wasn't that she didn't know she couldn't. She felt, you know, that she had no power to not. If she didn't follow the orders, she felt that there was going to be consequences with that. And that's scary. So she go out there, go save some people, go be amazing. I hope this speech was inspiring to help you think about things that don't want to be all about negative things. I'm sure that this room is full of people that have done amazing things and us, uh, that the world could not live without you. So I ask you to go save people's lives one check at a time. Thanks for uh, paying attention. <laughs> if you like what you see here, would you please share it? I'd love you to keep my platform going here on uh, technical education and uh, um, the ways to be great in your craftsmanship. So keep on wrenching, and we'll see you again in the future. Thanks for being a subscriber and follower of the channel.